the Robin Hood of venture capital. It's about a woman who went from homeless to venture capital fund founder. As one of the few black women to break into the boys club of Silicon Valley, Arlen Hamilton wants to get you to your first million dollars. I had been working for probably three years at this point on raising a fund of some sort, something for underrepresented founders at the time. And I was living out of a hotel, sharing a room with my mom. Every single day, we didn't know if we were gonna have one or two meals that day. It was very, very touch and go. And um, I had to make this decision of like, why am I doing this? And also, is it, does it make more sense to just kind of not do the big thing and do, the, do something a little bit different that's easier? And so I was in the parking lot of the hotel we were staying in, and I was pacing, and I was walking back and forth. And I said, should, should I continue with Backstage Capital? And I just decided to do this exercise, and this exercise was close your eyes and imagine the world five years from now, and imagine that the thing you want to do so deeply does not exist in the world. And I did that, and I still remember to this day the feeling of my eyes Sh shooting open and I said I can't imagine a world in five years where backstage capital does not exist it just doesn't make sense to me it doesn't work and to make it even further solidified that this is what I was supposed to do I felt that even if I wasn't the one who made it happen even if I wasn't there with it that it still needed to be there so that moment really taught me go all in and you have to try. So that's the day that I decided, okay, um, have no money, ran out of food stamps, barely have a place to stay, but I'm gonna raise millions of dollars for underrepresented, underestimated founders. And not only that, I'm going to invest in a hundred companies within five years or so. And ended up um, getting to that goal, that milestone, in three years instead of five. I grew up in Dallas, Texas. I was born in Jackson, Mississippi, and then I spent the next 20 years or so in Dallas with my mother and my younger brother, Alfred. It was 2011, and I had heard about a place called Silicon Valley, and I didn't quite understand what that meant, but it seemed interesting. And I saw people like Ashton Kutcher and Justin Bieber and Ellen DeGeneres and Troy Carter were making investments in a place called Silicon Valley. I wanted to know what that meant. And so I started paying attention to people behind the scenes in entertainment to see what they were working on. Um, because it was not only these artists, but it was their managers. And in the hallways of the uh, stadiums and the arenas that I would work as a music production coordinator, I would also hear whispers about investing in startups. And I wanted to know why people with money were chasing that. So I did a little research and I got really excited about it. I thought, this is a new frontier. This is really interesting. I've always felt like an entrepreneur and I think this is what that is. This is my tribe. The, the negative side though was that I found out quickly after that that only 10% of venture funding and angel investing goes to women, people of color, LGBTQ founders, and other. So if you're a white man in Silicon Valley, you have a higher chance of making and raising capital uh, than you do if you're anyone else. And that didn't make much sense to me in, in a country where white men make up only a third of the population. So that's when things changed a little bit for me. That's when uh, my life changed, is when I decided, instead of trying to raise capital for one company, some company that I would be the CEO of, what if I tried to raise, and what if I did raise money to put behind other founders who looked like me? And that's when I started Backstage Capital. And since then, um, you know, I had said, in 2014, I think it was, I said I wanted to invest in 100 companies by 2020. We've gone on to raise about $20 million and we've invested in more than 200 companies. Raising all of this money has not been easy. It has been a challenge every step of the way. I call it 
pushing a mountain up another mountain. Uh, but it has been very rewarding because now we have hundreds and hundreds of founders who have been backed. And I feel like it started with just that one idea in a bedroom in Pearland, Texas, just a few years ago. And I'm very proud of that, to be here now and have so much innovation come from that one idea. It's important for a fund like mine to exist because we have a lot of time to make up for. There has just been so much inequality in this country for so long. And economic empowerment is a remedy to a lot of that damage that has been done. And you talk about generational wealth. You can't get to generational wealth if you're not even able to get uh, parity in the now. And uh, think about also innovation. Like when you back black founders, brown founders, women, people of color, LGBTQ, when you're backing these entrepreneurs, you're also backing the next great health tech company, the next great infrastructure company, great sustainability company. All of these innovations are coming from these brilliant minds that are being either overlooked or undervalued or both. And for me, the idea of sourcing and bringing these companies and these founders to light um, and just simply clearing their path for them to do the thing they were already doing and do so well, to me, that is the, the, the best way and the best use of my time. I can be a catalyst for the work that they do, which I think is so, so important. So it's about all of us. It's about helping all of us uh, succeed, no matter what your background is, when you help one of us succeed. And um, I also think that it's fair, to be honest. There's a lot of inequality that needs to be fixed and balanced. It's just really important, in my opinion, to have thousands and thousands and more and more and more people of color, women, LGBTQ, millions, knowing, understanding that they can start companies, that they are privy to all that this country has to offer them, that it doesn't belong to a chosen few. It's just very important to me. When I was in the third grade, I wore six watches, three on each arm, and they were, you know, bubblegum watches, uh, bubblegum machine watches, and, uh, but they, were all, they all worked, and they were all set to a different time zone. And I had just learned, I got an encyclopedia set. My mom got an encyclopedia set, for, I think from a traveling salesperson. <laughs> and I had just learned about time zones, so I was just so enthralled and fascinated by the fact that someone in a different part of the world it could be a different time for them. I just didn't, it just blew my mind, really. So I wore six watches to kind of keep up with what everybody was doing. I would be at school and I'd look down at my watches and I'd say, okay, well, in Hawaii, it's this time. In Australia, it's this time. In, in Kenya, it's this time. And I just had the best time with it. I knew that people were staring. I knew that people thought I was weird. They called me weird. This is third grade where people can be very cruel. I was called names. I was made fun of, mostly just laughed at. But I didn't care. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. I still do. And I think that sort of off the beaten path, weird kid, seeing things in a different way, and also being hyper curious and actually caring a lot about other people, I think that has actually really helped me as a, as a venture capitalist, a venture catalyst, as I say. And it helps me look at things in, in a different light. I, I don't have this very traditional way of looking at investments, for instance, or what will be the next best thing. I don't look at trends because I don't care about trends. I care about what moves me, just like art, really. It's like when you look at art, art is about what stirs you. And that's what uh, I do when I look at companies. So I'm very um, happy for the little girl who wore six watches because today, you know, they called me weird, they called me disruptive. Now I get paid to do both.